Welcome to the Search for Emma Filipov podcast, an amalgamated collection of known facts about the disappearance of Emma Filipov. In part one of the Search for Emma Filipov, you'll meet Kimberly Bordage, a volunteer who, for the last four years, has been working alongside Emma's mother, Shelley Filipov. In this time, Kimberly has researched and dissected every aspect of Emma's year in Victoria, which includes the eight days leading up to her disappearance and the hundreds of tips that continually pour in. Kimberly is no stranger to having a missing loved one, which has always been a catalyst to dedicate her time to this research. Some of that time has been spent working with members of the army of amazing people from all over the world who are trying to help find Emma, and who continue to support Shelley in her ongoing search for her daughter. In this podcast, Kimberly will go over the official timeline she authored in 2016. This will be the first telling of the complete assembly of facts of the case, so be sure to expect we will be digging far deeper than ever into this updated timeline. In part two, we will be following the compelling new witness who recently came forward with information that may help trace some of Emma's steps that night. You'll also hear Shelley's thoughts on this new lead and the upcoming 30-day search campaign. It was the first time in all of this that I actually believe that it was Emma. So first, let's focus on what we know about the days leading up to Emma's disappearance. Nine days in November. So we're going to begin with Tuesday, November 20th, when Emma visited the YMCA in downtown Victoria, located just down the street from the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter. Records show Emma had taken out a membership just five days prior, on the 15th, and this would be her third visit to the Y. The surveillance video captured on the 20th shows her entering and exiting the building four times, pausing for about a minute each time, watching out the glass doors as though she's waiting for someone outside, until she exits for the last time and turns right. She scanned her pass that day at 11.38 a.m., then again at 11.54 a.m., and one final time at 12.09 p.m. We can see that Emma is holding something in her hands in the way one would hold a cell phone or iPod. Emma was known for her dislike for things like cell phones, but her friend Connor, who you met in the Nighttime podcast, said he recalled Emma somehow acquiring an iPod Touch that summer. He wasn't sure how long she'd held on to it, but he remembers her using it in places with Wi-Fi service, such as the library or the YMCA. On Wednesday, November 21st at 11.42 a.m., Emma called to arrange to have a driver pick her up at the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter and drive out to West Coast Super Storage, where her van had been stored since August, in order to have it towed back to downtown Victoria. The driver picked her up at 12.45 p.m. and said Emma seemed very nice and polite. She was quiet at first, but upbeat during the ride and talked about her plan to surprise her family by flying back home to Perth, Ontario. She seemed very excited and happy about the prospect of returning. He said she looked up at the snow on the mountains and said she hated the rain. She couldn't wait to get home where she could see the sun and snow. At first, Emma wanted the driver to tow her van to the bus depot in order to pack up her belongings that were stored in the van and send them home on a bus. And then she would immediately hop on a bus to the airport and catch a flight home. But the driver told her he couldn't drop the van at an empty lot near Courtney Street like she wanted because it would have been towed right away for parking violation. Instead, it was dropped off at the 700 block of Burdett Avenue paid parking lot where it stayed until the 25th. 
she used her debit card to pay the $202 towing charge. There are no reports for Thursday, November the 22nd. The only clues lie in the loose notes that she left behind. They included optimistic and fairly organized plans as she prepared to leave Victoria and move to Japan. She wanted to send her journals and art on a bus home to Ontario, donate her books and other items, sell her camera, have a freedom fire with select items at French Beach Provincial Park, scrap removal for the van, rent a car from National Car Rental, and purchase a prepaid visa in order to rent a car. She would either go home to Perth or stay with her aunt in Lanceville, BC, as she prepared to travel to Japan. Emma used the office phone at the shelter to make the first call to her mom. She was in tears and said she needed to come home. These calls were supervised by staff. For Emma to call Shelley that night was very unusual and she cried throughout the conversation. She wouldn't say what was bothering her, and Shelley knew that prying would only push her away. They talked a little about Emma's dog, who would be so excited to see her, and Shelley assured her that all of the arrangements would be made for her to fly out the following day in order to help her come home. It's clear that something happened between the 21st and the 23rd that made Emma finally decide to start reaching out for help like this rather than surprise her family with her arrival in Perth. Shelley later learned from staff at the shelter that they were frightened by the recent and sudden changes they had seen in Emma's personality. She seemed to be having a mental health crisis during this time, going from sweet to paranoid in less than two weeks, and they thought she might be suicidal. She was overhydrating and barely eating or sleeping, a loose note that we caught a glimpse of in the CBC documentary Finding Emma, written during this time, shows that she wrote the word mom about a hundred times all over the page, along with I love you and I'm sorry. Her last journal entry was written on the 23rd of November. Sleep depth hurts. Very hopeful. Checked myself out. Mom is coming. It's November 23rd. Have to get home before Dad goes. I want to call Dad. You're going home tomorrow. Contrary to what is implied in the CBC documentary, Shelley and Emma kept in touch fairly regularly by email during the year that Emma was in Victoria. The messages were positive and loving, but they were also cryptic and lacking in detail. Just three weeks before this first tearful phone call, shortly after Emma left her seasonal job, and just before things seemed to start to fall apart, Emma sent her mom an upbeat response, telling her that she wasn't sure yet what her plans were for Christmas, and this last message ended on a very loving note. On Saturday, November 24th, Emma called back hours later and asked her mom not to book her a flight home. She wanted to stay in Victoria and figure things out on her own. Shelley was worried and could sense that something was wrong, but respected Emma's wishes and cancelled her flight. Later that same night though, Emma called again, possibly from a payphone. She was overwhelmed and needed help to pack up all of her belongings. Shelley immediately booked the first flight out the next day. On Sunday, November 25th, Emma phoned her mom sounding much more calm and confident that she could sort things out on her own. Although Shelley agreed not to come, she decided not to unpack this time, assuring Emma before hanging up that she would come if she needed her. Later that day, at around 1 p.m., 
Emma's van had to be moved for the second time that week because of parking enforcement, and she had no choice but to arrange for the van to be towed literally next door to the Chateau Victoria Hotel parking lot. There were no known reports about Monday the 26th until the summer of 2015 when Shelley traveled to Victoria to pick up Emma's belongings and bring them home. It was during this visit that police showed Shelley surveillance video of Emma captured on November 26, 2012. The footage shows her standing outside the San Piper condo building on Quadra Street, seemingly waiting to get into the building. Shelley said Emma looked very uneasy in this footage. Rather than use the public phone or the phone at the shelter, Emma knocked on a stranger's door at the Sandpiper at 3.20 p.m. and asked the resident if she could use his phone to make a long-distance phone call, assuring him she'd pay for the call with a credit card. She seemed nice, was neatly dressed, and showed no signs of drug use, so he let her in to use his phone. He thinks that she may have called her father, but was only able to leave a voicemail message. She likely left a message since the record of this call on the credit card is how police discovered that Emma visited the apartment. Shelley thinks that she may have missed a call from Emma that day because she was at work. She isn't sure why she wasn't told sooner about this odd incident or why there is no definitive answer as to who Emma called and what was said in the voicemail message she left. By Tuesday, November 27th, Shelley was expecting another call from Emma and became very concerned when she didn't hear from her. So she decided to dial the number on call display, thinking Sandy Merriman might be the name of a friend that Emma was staying with. Instead, she learned that Emma had been living at a women's shelter on and off since the winter of 2011. Privacy laws prevented them from sharing any information, so Shelley asked if they could at least tell her if Emma was safe, and they said she was. Shelley would learn the following day that this was very far from the truth. Staff had noticed frightening changes in Emma within the last 10 days, and they thought that she may have been suicidal. Later that same day, Staff from the Chateau Victoria Hotel put a notice on Emma's van to have it moved. So, for the third time in a span of one week, this heavy burden that held the promise of freedom had become a complete hindrance to her plans. Later that night, Emma finally called her mom and again asked for help to come home. She told her mom she didn't know if she could face her. Shelley was still packed and told Emma that she would be making arrangements to fly out the next day. The Day of Emma's Disappearance On Wednesday, November 28th, at 4.30 a.m., Emma phoned Shelley for the last time to say, Don't come, Mom. Not today. The call was brief, and she seemed calm, but tired and distant. Shelley offered to fly out and stay in a hotel close by, just in case Emma needed her, but she just said, no, that's okay, Mom. Shelley told her she would cancel her flight, and against the advice of her family, who really wanted her to respect Emma's wishes, she took the first flight out to Victoria that afternoon. That morning at 7 a.m., Emma went to the Chateau Victoria Hotel regarding the notice on her van. She was very upset and in tears, asking staff for just one more day to move the van, which they granted. If she couldn't move it on the 29th, they would have to arrange to have it towed to their impound lot. At 8.23 a.m., Emma was captured on video surveillance at the 7-Eleven store at the corner of Douglas and Humboldt, where she used her debit card to purchase a $200 prepaid credit card. She had on a beige winter jacket with camouflage pants, her hair tied up in a bun, 
carrying several bags over her shoulder, including her orange purse. We see her pay for the item, then she lingers in the store for a while, seemingly nervous or hesitant to leave, peering out the glass doors as though she's looking for someone, or maybe waiting for the right moment to leave. Shelley said that she's never seen Emma behave in this manner. It was out of character. It was around 10 a.m. when Julian said he caught a glimpse of Emma while riding the bus and decided to get off a few stops early to talk to her. She was standing on the edge of the sidewalk on Pandora Street, one step away from the road. Julian approached her and observed her from the back and profile, but couldn't quite see her face, so he decided to go register for his health card as planned and returned not long after to find Emma still standing there motionless on the corner. He says that at that point he stepped onto the street in front of her and peered into her hoodie and asked if she needed help, and Emma only shook her head as if to say no. He stood with her for a while until he decided that it would be best to walk away. Sometime that morning, a man and his daughter were doing some work at the Nootka Court on Douglas and Humboldt. They reported seeing Emma as she wandered past them a few times, going in and out of the building again and again. Also sometime that morning, a man who visited the Rock Bay Landing Shelter on Pandora Avenue said he saw Emma there that morning having breakfast with everyone. No other details were provided other than the fact that she seemed to be alone. Rock Bay is a shelter that Emma reportedly refused to stay in because it was co-ed. In the early afternoon, the same father-daughter duo that saw Emma at Nootka Court earlier noticed her again, this time standing on the corner of Douglas Street and Courtney Street. They'd seen Emma around town before, and this was very unusual. She looked confused and completely lost. She was wearing shoes when they saw her, but later heard from others who saw Emma that day wandering barefoot in the street. When they heard Emma was missing a day or two later, they contacted police and gave their report. I'm not sure where this next particular tip originated, but it's been circling for years that some people think Emma visited the library around noon that day. Still in the early afternoon, a friend and colleague of Emma's from Redfish Bluefish, where she worked until Halloween Day, saw her near Our Place Soup Kitchen on Pandora Street. Her hair was tucked into her jacket and she seemed to be alone. When he approached her to say hello, she told him that she wasn't feeling well and couldn't talk, and when he offered her a hug, he said that she retreated and seemed frightened, then turned to walk away. A witness walking on Pandora Avenue at around 1 p.m. that day saw Emma slowly shuffling with a vacant look in her eyes. It was busy on Pandora that day, so she was alerted to Emma's state and how slow she was moving. She was wearing her camouflage pants and a white fleece jacket, carrying several plastic bags and an orange purse across her chest. She wasn't wearing a hat, and her hair looked as though it had been freshly washed. She reported the sighting to police once she saw Emma on the news the next day. Another witness reported seeing Emma walking downtown sometime that afternoon with an older man but a description of the man was never provided. It was reported that Emma called to have her van towed again at some point in the late afternoon. It was said she wanted it moved from the parking lot, possibly back to West Coast Storage in Souk. But for some unknown or undisclosed reason, it didn't work out. We were unable to obtain any other information about this. Sometime between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., Emma was sighted again by the same person at two different locations. She first crossed his path as they exited the Douglas Street doors of the Bay Center, just a couple blocks north of the Empress Hotel. He said that she was shuffling along, moving slowly northward on the west side of Douglas Street, 
her long mane of hair flowing out from the side of her hood. About 45 minutes later, the witness was in his car at this point, stopped at the corner of Douglas and Finlayson, when to his surprise, he saw Emma again crossing the street in front of his car. She glanced his way as he crossed the street, and he smiled, and he said, What I received back was so sad. The type of smile you smile when you're holding back tears. He immediately felt that he should park the car and ask her if she was okay, but stopped himself for fear that she might feel uncomfortable being approached by a man. He saw the news of her disappearance in the paper two days later and felt a great deal of guilt for not following his gut instincts to help her. On the morning of November 30th, he went to Vic PD headquarters to report these two sightings in the hopes that they would follow the security cameras on Douglas Street to trace her steps. They took his contact information, but he never got a call back to give a full report. At 5.54 p.m., Emma used her debit card to purchase a prepaid cell phone and a pack of cigarettes at the same 7-Eleven where she purchased the prepaid credit card that morning. Video surveillance shows her paying for the phone, then once again she lingers in the store by the doors, nervously peering outside as if she's hesitant to leave or looking out for someone. The cell phone that she purchased has never been activated. At 6 p.m., Emma went to the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter. Witnesses at the shelter reported her becoming very anxious and upset when she was apparently informed by a staff member that her mother was on the way. They said she grabbed her things and bolted through the kitchen out the front door. We know that a staff member was present as Emma made these calls to her mom, and Shelley spoke with staff on the phone the day before so they likely knew there was some back and forth about her coming and probably heard how shocked Shelley sounded to hear that Emma had been staying there. But Shelley did not actually tell them that she was coming to Victoria, so it's still unclear how they knew. At 6.10 p.m., a taxi was parked illegally on the corner of Courtney and Douglas when he noticed Emma standing alone by a building looking really confused. She stood there for a while, then stepped into his cab and asked him to take her to the airport. He noticed that she didn't have any luggage and asked where she was planning to fly. She said she didn't know. When he told her the ride would cost $60, Emma told him she couldn't afford the fare even though she had two to $3,000 in her bank account. She then asked to be dropped off exactly where she was picked up. When they arrived, she wanted to sit in his cab for a while, but she became nervous when she heard sounds coming from the radio. At that point, she paid the $7 fare and exited the car. When the driver heard about Emma in the news the following day, he got in touch with police to report that she was seen in his cab the night before. After Emma's disappearance, Shelley met with him for about an hour at a coffee shop in Victoria, and he told her the same story he told police. Emma was acting different compared to the times that he'd interacted with her at the waterfront eatery where she worked. To me, she looked totally different, like she wasn't there, he said. It wasn't the same girl, because I talked to her at Redfish Bluefish a couple times. Dennis first met Emma in the foreign language section of the Victoria Public Library in September of 2012. He noticed she was looking at books on Japanese people and culture, and having studied the language himself, he struck up a 10-minute conversation with her on the subject. As they were leaving, Emma asked for his email address to get in touch if she had any questions about Japan or the Japanese community in Victoria. He gave it to her without asking for hers in return. Dennis described Emma during that first encounter as a free-spirited hippie, soft and kind, yet he also caught a glimpse of something in her that reminded him of Japanese society 
He wondered if what she showed to the world was not exactly who she was. Emma never did send Dennis an email, but he saw her again at the library a few weeks later. He decided not to approach her this time as she was busy on the computer. The third time Dennis saw Emma on November 28th at around 6.15 p.m., he knew right away something was very wrong. Standing at the far end of the pedestrian island on the corner of Douglas Street and Burdett Avenue, she appeared confused and disheveled. Dressed in layered clothing and her hair a tangled mess, Emma barely recognized Dennis when he approached her to say hello. She stood there sort of motionless, looking through him, staring in the direction of the water. She asked him what his name was again and where he was going. He told her that he was on his way home to James Bay, and Emma asked if she could walk with him for a while. Almost shuffling a pace less than the average person, she kept stopping to look all around and kept looking back downtown as if she was looking out for someone. They slowly made their way along Douglas Street, headed to Government Street, where they were doing some restoration work on the side of the Empress. Emma stopped when they reached the wooded walkway that was set up, and she peered inside the tunnel, hesitating to walk through it. He noticed she was barefoot below her bell-bottomed camouflage pants, and her arms were folded as she clutched her shoes and a small box close to her chest. A large orange purse hung over her shoulder, along with a smaller, colorful purse. He noted that although it was drizzling rain and fairly cold outside, Emma didn't seem to be struggling as she walked barefoot on the damp ground. They managed to walk only a few short blocks in 30 minutes, and Emma didn't say much. She seemed really out of it, and Dennis couldn't tell if she was on drugs. When he asked her, she said she wasn't, but he wanted to know if she was aware of her surroundings. So at one point, he tested her by pretending to cross a busy street on a no-walking signal. As he took a step out into the road, she said, no, don't. Then she started crossing the street when the signal changed. Emma kept looking all around, and Dennis asked a few times if she was looking for someone or if someone was following her. She'd just respond with no or hang on while looking all around. By 10 after 7, Emma said she had to go and started walking on her own along Government Street. As she made her way towards the Empress Hotel, Dennis decided to duck into the Milestones restaurant across from the Empress to make a 911 call at 7.11 p.m. Dennis waited and watched as Emma stood by the Captain Cook statue, staring up at the little trees covered in Christmas lights. At 7.17 p.m., Dennis watched from afar as two police officers located Emma still standing by the statue. He observed them talking with her for about 10 minutes before walking away, assuming she was safely in their care. Dennis was visiting family in Sydney when he saw a photo of Emma in the paper nearly a week later. He called the Victoria Police Department once he'd made the connection and told them that he was the one that made the 911 call that night and was most likely the last person to see Emma before she spoke to police. A week went by before Dennis got a call back from the RCMP asking him for details about that night. It wasn't until three months later that an officer with the Victoria Police Department called him to take his report. Two officers responded to Dennis Quay's 911 call and located Emma at 7.17 p.m. at the top of the staircase across from the Empress Hotel. According to police notes, at no time did Emma engage in dialogue but rather gave one-word answers or just nodded her head. She refused when they asked her to put on her shoes, and they said it was almost 30 minutes before she even spoke to give them her name at their insistence. According to the police officer interviewed for the CBC documentary, Emma told them, 
I'm just working through some things right now. I'm going for a walk, and then I'm going to a friend's house. By 8 p.m., they had decided that she was not a threat to herself or anyone else, and allowed her to continue on her way. At the time, the officer spoke to her at length, and there was no reason to apprehend her under the Mental Health Care Act. On May 19, 2015, Shelley sent a Freedom of Information request to view the 45-minute police transcript. The request was denied. While police were talking with Emma that night, Shelley was on a flight to Victoria, BC. When she arrived at the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter at 11 p.m., she was shocked to learn that Emma didn't claim her bed that night. And it wasn't long before the second 911 call was made for Emma that day. By midnight, four hours after she was last seen talking with police, Emma was declared a missing person. They would later tell Shelley about the incident when Emma moved shelter furniture outside, as well as the fact that she was throwing away or donating most of her personal belongings. She would also learn about the call made to mental health emergency services. They were told to call back if Emma's condition persisted or worsened, but they never made that second call. It would seem that this is why Emma was declared a missing person so swiftly. Next, we'll be presenting two new witness accounts who saw Emma on the night she vanished. On the four-year anniversary of Emma's disappearance, a man phoned Shelley late in the evening to say he saw Emma at midnight, on the night of November 28th, still standing across from the Empress Hotel. The witness didn't provide his name or any other details, just that he recalls the orange purse and that she was alone. It was his assertion that he didn't come forward sooner because he felt it wasn't a salient tip. However, his mind was changed once he saw all the media coverage marking the four-year anniversary of Emma's disappearance and decided at that time to call Shelley. He expressed regret over not offering Emma a ride that night. In his words, he didn't want to seem creepy and frighten her, so he walked away. Kimberly had the chance to interview our second witness, who had an interaction with Emma just after 5 a.m. on November 29th. What is significant is that this was nine hours after she was last seen by police outside the Empress Hotel, and just five hours after our first witness saw her standing by the Empress. On November 29th, I woke up late for work at my new job and I rushed out the door and hopped in my 2006 Equinox and headed for Saanich from a Mall. And I was heading up Admirals, north on Admirals, and was just cresting a hill. And ahead of me was a woman in distress who leapt off of the street and onto the sidewalk. She looked like she was looking around like somebody was after her. Then she turned and faced the vehicle, sort of. She looked past my vehicle and let out a huge scream. Well, I couldn't hear her because the windows were up, but she definitely looked like she was screaming. I, I just pulled over immediately. I could tell she was in trouble. And so I pulled over right away. At one point, just before I picked her up, she, she kind of crouched down for a second and put her hands over her ears. And then she stood up, she sort of popped up and she looked in the direction of my vehicle, kind of past it and started to scream. But she wasn't looking at my windshield. She wasn't even really looking at my car. She was looking past it. And there was nothing, there was nothing behind me but an intersection with nobody in it. And when she let out the last scream, just as I pulled up and she was looking past the vehicle, um, I can't remember if I opened the door or if she opened the door, but she got in right away. And I said, well, what's the matter? Is somebody after you? Are you in trouble? What's, what's going on? And she says, oh, it's, it's nothing. It's just my dad. And I was just, my guard went up because I knew that was a lie. There's no way somebody's dad has them screaming bloody murder at five o'clock in the morning in their bare feet 
in rain in November. She was soaked. Her hair was drenched and stuck to her, like drenched to the bone. She had all, it hadn't been, it wasn't raining super hard. So I knew she had been out for a while because you couldn't get that wet if you were out for 20 minutes. I think I, I might have said something like you must be freezing or something, but I, I cranked the heat. I, the first thing I do when I get in a vehicle is crank the heat. So as soon as she got in, she was warm. She had a really light colored, long sleeve, sort of, it must have been a button up jumper because it was kind of hanging off of her a little bit. Um, she kind of had her pants up to her knees, like pulled up kind of like capris or something. I assume just to keep from stepping on the back of them because they were soaking wet. And then she had a purse over her left shoulder down to her right hip and it had a sweater hanging over it. And then she had her shoes in her hand. The shoes really caught my eye because they were comfortable looking shoes. They didn't look like, oh, somebody's out, been out all night in high heels. They were comfy looking shoes. William said he felt certain that she wasn't on drugs as she looked healthy and clean. Her eyes were bright and she had white teeth and a clear complexion. Everything about her movements and actions hinted at something psychological. At the time, I just thought something wasn't right with her. I hadn't seen any cars following us. I hadn't seen any evidence that anybody was after her except for the fact that she looked so scared before I picked her up. And I mean, she looked, I haven't seen anybody look that scared. It was like a horror film kind of face. I don't understand how there couldn't have been. I mean, there was nobody after her. There was nobody there. As they drove north on Admirals, he noticed that she wasn't showing any signs of fear at all now. She wasn't looking at the window or ducking down, hiding from view. She went from looking terrified to seemingly calm and happy within a minute. She pulled up her long, wet hair and tied it up in a loose bun. I started to drive and she said, where are you going? And I said, I'm late for work. I've got to be there. I, I've I can't be any later than I am. I'm brand new at this job. And we started to drive on and she said, well, can you take me to my friends in Colwood? And I said, that's that's really far out of the way. I can I can take you closer to Colwood. And she said, but she's really great. We can all be friends. Um, I was just like, no, no. Something tells me that we're too early in the morning to make friends with anybody right now. She was kind of... I don't know how I would describe it. Like she was slow and kind of, I don't know, spacey in a way, just kind of, I don't know. I would compare her, I guess, to one of my hippie friends talking. She didn't use any slang, like let's go do some drugs or let's drink. She didn't say let's go party with my friend or anything like that, that you would expect from someone at five o'clock in the morning. She was super calm the whole time she talked to me. That was the, I just witnessed her screaming and yelling and, and darting back and forth on the sidewalk and looking around like somebody was after her or, or something was after her. And then she gets in and she's just cool as a cucumber. You would never have known that she had just stood in the street screaming. And I mean, I got a good 10 second look at what she was doing before she got in the car. And I, I just couldn't figure out how she could just dismiss what I had just seen. When I was driving, I was looking in the rear view because I thought there's got to be an angry boyfriend behind this or something. Like she looked that scared. And then when she said the dad thing, I just, that's what really stuck with me. That one comment the whole time. Oh, it's just my dad. I was always wondering, well, was she hearing a voice that was her dad's? Was she like, because she just went to it so fast that it had to be something that was actually on her mind. Right. I don't think it was the, the first lie she came up with. I think she went with, with exactly what was on her mind and it just wasn't making sense to me. She kept asking him to take her to Colwood as they continued along Admiral Road. She didn't mention her friend's name or address and she never pulled out a cell phone to call this friend. She, she talked up her friend and I said, I'm sorry, there's just no way 
I can take you any farther than where where I'm going if you're going to Colwood. And then she kept trying to convince me. I said, there's just, there's no way I can. I can't, I'm late for this job. It's, I'm, I haven't been there very long, I'll get fired. They drove for about five minutes until he came to a full stop at the intersection of Craigflower and Admirals in the town of View Royal, right next to a 24-hour gas station where he assumed she would seek shelter for a while. So we pulled up to, from Admirals, we pulled up to Craig Flower and hit a red light. And I motioned or alluded to the fact that Colwood was to our left and that if she wanted to go there, that was the direction to go and that I was going straight. And she leaned over, gave me a kiss on the cheek and slowly slid out of the vehicle onto her tiptoes in a weird way and kind of dipped her feet down to the ground. Does that make sense? She kind of slid down the seat sort of, like for a soft landing on her feet. Um, it could very well have been that her feet were sore. Easily could have been that her feet were sore. The way she was moving, it was actually like she was walking on hot coals. When I let her out, she never looked at me like she was upset to be leaving the vehicle. She never begged to just, she got out and she just, it was like a light switch again. And she was right back to this manic, darting back and forth and paranoid look and really scared look on her face. I didn't feel like she even realized I was there anymore. She didn't look like she knew, oh, I'm going to call it. It looked like she had forgot our entire conversation by the time she got out. She looked over at the petrol can and then she walked in front of my vehicle and all her steps and everything she was doing was very exaggerated and very big, long steps. I don't know if you've ever seen Monty Python, but it was similar to a silly walk. And, but she looked scared again. She immediately looked scared. And I, part of me, just a small part of me thought, well, if somebody's after her, she thinks that he's going to be here any minute. When she got out and started acting that way again, I was pretty sure it was something, something mental. I mean, there was this 1% chance in my mind where I thought, if somebody is after her, I've just dropped her off, but I've taken her four and a half kilometers away from that spot. So to me, it just didn't add up. Why, why would you scream on the sidewalk if somebody is chasing you? Wouldn't you jump into the bushes or, or hide behind a car or something? Why would you? So it, it, yeah, no, it didn't add up. And then she looked over at the Petrocan, which was a 24 hour gas station. That's where I thought she was gonna go. Um, she didn't want to go in there, obviously. So she turned and ran out into the middle of the intersection and went left towards Colwood, did not like that direction, right? back towards the petrocan, didn't like that direction again, and then went back left. And she didn't look over at the vehicle or anything or wave at me or anything like that. She just, so I, I had to sit for another 10 seconds and watch that before she darted off the road. And then she took off in the direction of Colwood. It would have been about quarter past that I dropped her off. It was still dark. It was probably wouldn't have, I don't think it would have been light out for another hour or hour and a half. They parted ways at 5.15 that morning, and although William did hear not long after of a woman who went missing in Victoria, the police and media reports all stated that she was last seen with friends on Burdett Avenue between Blanchard and Quadra Streets, where the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter is located. And I remember thinking, where did they get that information? That's not, that's not at all true. And thinking the press was wrong, that they were misleading. There was no mention of a woman walking barefoot in the rain who had vanished after being assessed by two police officers. No mention of a 911 call for Emma from a concerned acquaintance. And no mention of the only piece of evidence, the $200 prepaid credit card used five days later at a gas station in Colwood by a man who lived in the area. During a CTV news segment that aired on December 13th, 
Two weeks after Emma vanished, the truth about her last known location was stated publicly in the passing for the first time by Shelley, and there was no mention of misreporting by police and journalists. An article released that same day elsewhere in BC actually stated that Emma was last seen by staff at the women's shelter around 6 p.m. Nowhere does it mention police or the Empress or even her friends. All along it's been wrong, right from the, the, the falsifying of the first press release, being told not to worry about things like false information in press releases and to focus on my daughter and to be honest, what they said was they, it was probably a typo. A typo. Can you imagine calling that a typo? It wasn't until January 10th, 2013, 42 days after Emma vanished, that CTV aired a two and a half minute news segment about the Victoria Police Department conducting a routine evidence search of the Inner Harbor. It was not publicly corrected that it was actually the police who last saw Emma by the Empress Hotel, several blocks away from the shelter. For the next month, two more articles were written about Emma's disappearance, one in Campbell River and one in Ottawa, and both still contain the uncorrected report that Emma was last seen with friends. The first accurate news report to come out in print was published on February 16, 2013, two weeks after Shelley had returned to Ontario and two and a half months after Emma went missing. So, it took 79 days for the general public to learn about the Empress Hotel location and her interaction with police. It wasn't until at least after February that I even had a slight inkling that it was Emma. And it was as soon as I heard on the news that she was barefoot with the police in front of the Empress that I immediately went, oh, wait a minute. I know exactly where that person went after that. If they'd have said anything about the Empress and her being bare feet within days of her missing, I would have noticed that right away. I'd have went, that was me. I picked her up a couple days ago. And instead, it was months later. And by then, it was like, well, what good does that do anybody? All I did was pick her up, take her from here to here, and drop her off. Beginning in early 2013, the town of View Royal and District of Saanich replaced the 80-year-old Craigflower Bridge. I always worried about the bridge there, especially because they had rebuilt it not too long afterwards. And I always worried that something was either going to get covered up or brushed away there. As the bridge began getting built, I thought I should, I should go forward and say something. And I said something to uh, a family member or something. And they said, well, the, the case is cold. And when you dropped her off, she was OK. She was alive. So what's the point in saying anything? And I just went, yeah, yeah I guess you're right. OK. And then there was times over the years that I'd ask other friends, I'd say, hey, you know, I'd explain the story to them and I'd say, should I, should I say something? And, and almost unanimously, every one of my friends has always told me not to go forward. By November of 2017, William was the proud father of a one-year-old baby girl, and he realized that staying silent was no longer an option for him but he needed to be sure the dates lined up correctly before getting in touch with the Victoria Police Department. I got to work at 527, I punched in. That is actually how I figured out what day it was, was because I went back to the records of when I first got my job and had my boss look up the electronic records and see exactly what time I'd punched in that day. And that was the one day I was late, 45 minutes late. <laughs> memorably late definitely i was being trained at that time too so i had somebody relying on me so i felt even worse about it i originally called vic pd and they said well no you've got to make an anonymous tip to crime stoppers so i called crime stoppers last year at some point end of last year and for the last few years, every once in a while, I'd hop on and, and type Emma's name in and, and see if there's anything that's come up. Jordan's podcast, I started listening to that in the last three months, 
because I, I was looking into to see if Crime Stoppers had done anything, if there were any news articles about search areas near where I had given my information to Crime Stoppers and nothing was coming up. And so I started just kind of listening to everything that was out there about Emma. And it was deep into his podcasts where Shelley said something and it was just, it was one of those moments where I went, how can I, nobody else is doing anything but her. So I've got a hold of Shelley. After she finished talking to the police, from there on, we had so many tips. Um, there weren't any that I felt were accurate, except for this one. I really believe that William is right, and that was Emma. After William contacted Shelley in June of this year, we were hopeful that this new piece of information may help to at least trace some of Emma's steps that night, and we encouraged William to speak with the detective in charge of Emma's case. Well, when you dropped her off, do you know which direction she went? I said, well, as far as I know, the last direction she was going was towards Colwood. And she says, so then she went from there to where? And I said, well, she she went in the direction of Colwood. Okay, but she could have gone anywhere from there. And I said, well, I guess, but she's in bare feet, in the rain, soaking wet. And if she'd been out all night, she had to get tired at some point. We also know that it was almost daylight. The credit card was found in Colwood. That actually reinforced me to knowing that I had picked her up because right. I went well I took her closer to Colwood so of course her card if she if she went missing somewhere up that way of course her card shows up that's where she wanted me to take her I asked William if he ever recalled her tossing something out the window of his vehicle no the windows in the equinox have the center console is where the windows are I always remember nobody could ever find them. So the windows would have stayed up the whole time. And I, if anything, I would have rolled them up before she got in. William described a little bit about the surrounding area where he dropped her off and what routes she could have taken had she started walking along the Galloping Goose Trail. She would have came across, it must be the Galloping Goose, um, which goes along with the railroad tracks there. If she would went left at the railroad tracks, she actually would have ended up almost right back where I picked her up. And if she went right on the railroad tracks or the trail, it would have taken her eventually up towards Colwood. It would take at least two hours to get to Colwood from Craig Flower and Admirals. By foot, to get all the way up into Colwood, I would, I would think two hours would do it. He told me a bit about the little town of View Royal where he dropped her off, which is considered the gateway between Victoria's inner core and the West Shore. The town of View Royal has a total of 70 parks and 25 kilometers of trails, and includes Mackenzie, Pike, Pryor, and Thetis Lakes, as well as the Gorge Waterway, which is a narrow inlet that connects Victoria Harbor to Portage Inlet. Had she stayed in the area, she would have been steps away from the Craigflower Bridge and the historic Craigflower Manor and Schoolhouse. The area is part of a designated wildlife sanctuary. Had she started walking in the direction of Colwood and decided to stop and rest rather than continue along the Galloping Goose Trail, she would have come across Portage Park, a wooded park with a main trail and lots of little secluded trails. We know that Emma loved to walk to Thetis Lake, where she'd fill up her water jugs, and it seems this woman was headed in the direction of Colwood. So I asked William how long it would have taken her to walk farther past Portage Park and along the secluded Galloping Goose Trail to Thetis Lake. If she liked to go to Thetis and she was uh, like to walk to Thetis, then that was the trail to take. But that would have, I mean, it, it would have been at least an hour and a half, I think. To walk that far from where she was living from from craig flower admirals from okay. victoria to walk to thetis along the tracks i bet you that's a three hour walk this person that i dropped off was not about to become james bond and hide anywhere she was not well she didn't look like she was ready to go for another two or three hours of walking 
William can't help but replay that morning in his mind over and over, with plenty of should-haves and what-ifs. I wish I had got out and convinced her to get back in and I'd have taken her to where she wanted to go. I never should have let her out. The way she was looking around for whatever was bugging her, it wasn't going to stop tormenting her, it seemed. And as soon as she got out, I knew that, that she was in danger. I've been with people who have schizophrenia when they've had a real episode before. And what people are capable of when they're pushed from inside their own mind is, is almost worse than what others can do. If I, if I hadn't become a parent, I never would have looked at it like this. Oh, oh man, I never want to, I'll never, I'll never ever do something like that again. I'll be late for work next time. I appreciated that the fact that he even just took the time to pick her up and, 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 and talk to her and, and let her get warm for a little while. And I understood when he explained about going to work, I understood. I mean, he would have lost his job. Um, he wasn't sure what he was dealing with. He didn't realize that she was a missing person at the time. I mean, I think most people would have just driven by her. I don't think uh, the average person would have stopped and even picked her up to see if he could help, you know. Lots of me really hopes that Emma's hiding away somewhere. As, as sad as that is too. But most of me feels like she's somewhere still in the greater Victoria area and that we can find her. The worry that time had ruined all chances of finding her compelled William to look into the capabilities and limitations of sniffer dogs. After days of research and binging on search dog podcasts, he eventually discovered CBC's Someone Know Something more specifically, Season 1, Episode 6, titled The Scent. In the episode, Kim Cooper and her dogs were brought in to search for a young boy who had disappeared 43 years earlier. It was obvious from that episode and following episodes that Kim Cooper was a leader in the field of cadaver dogs. Four dogs keyed in underwater on a case that was 43 years old. And Kim Cooper on the show is saying, Oh yeah, actually the record for a dog to smell a body underwater was 315 feet. When William heard that we were having difficulty finding a cadaver search dog team in BC, who was able to assist us without a request from police, he thought it only right to take a chance and provide us with Kim Cooper's contact information. Kim Cooper did not hesitate when Kimberly approached her. All she needed to proceed was for the Victoria Police Department to be made aware of the search areas and dates. I think it's the police's responsibility to be actively searching and when they do get a tip like that, especially because of the coincidence of the card, I think that they should have right away said, well, let's go out and research that area. Mm -hmm. And Kim is volunteering her time. A tentative search date has been set, scheduled to fly out to Victoria from December 1st to December 3rd. I'm a little bit nervous about the search. I think uh, the timing is interesting, that it is that close to the sixth anniversary. I'm very pleased that Kim Cooper is going to be doing this for us. That's a very positive thing that action is being taken, but I'll be very nervous while it's taking place, wondering if they're going to find exactly what I don't want to find. We are incredibly grateful for Kim's willingness to help. Being that Kim is a volunteer, there must be enough money to help cover the cost of flights and accommodations. A GoFundMe campaign has been created that we'll be sharing with the public, along with a list of estimated travel expenses and planned search areas. Kim Cooper is the owner and senior instructor at Best Friends. She has been training dogs for over 30 years and has been instructing training classes for 25 years. She is a veteran of over 250 searches for missing persons and was featured in a CBC podcast, Someone Knows Something, and National Geographic's Finding Dial. Kimberly Bordage has a background in film and TV production and manages social media, press releases, and other matters related to the search. 
she is currently completing a mini documentary featuring Shelley Filipov titled November, which will be released to mark the sixth anniversary on November 28th, 2018. The mini doc will be a precursor to a larger film project that is in the early stages of pre-production. If the GoFundMe campaign is successful, Kimberly will travel to Victoria and meet with Kim Cooper in order to assist and document the search for Emma. We thank everyone for listening. Please feel free to share this link to the podcast. You can find the link to the GoFundMe campaign pinned to the top of the Help Find Emma Filipov Facebook page, as well as on the official website helpfindemma.ca. We encourage everyone to share this link as we only have 30 days to reach our goal. Thank you for listening to The Search for Emma Filipov.